hello everybody. Uh, my, my name is Guilherme Zagatti uh, and I'm currently, as uh, Professor Kyung mentioned, a PhD student uh, at the Institute for Data Science and he's my current supervisor. So I would, I would like to share a small presentation with you uh, that uh, talks a little bit about the, my, my experience with the PhD program. Uh, so, so one of the reasons I, I wanted to come to Singapore and to study at the US is because currently the country is following the Smart Nation Initiative and, and somebody like me who has a background in economics was very interested in policy that uh, has uh, applications to the economy and, and society. Uh, I wanted to learn from, from what's being done in Singapore, how they're leveraging technology to achieve like certain goals. And, and so I learned that the uh, NUS has a very strong cluster called the NUS Smart Nation Research Cluster that develops a range of uh, initiatives uh, towards this goal. So it goes from strategic capabilities in data sciences, uh, analytics and optimization, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. So in particular, the Institute of Data Science is located um, inside of the Smart Nation Research Cluster. And, I, I find it really great that I get to interact with a lot of people doing multidisciplinary research. Uh, myself, I, uh, I, have, uh, I have worked before and in, in, in fact, I graduated in economics and then in econometrics, mathematical economics. So I had a stronger background in the statistics and economics. Before even working with uh, coding and computers. I was actually an economist in Africa. Uh, I worked for two years uh, in the Ministry of Economic Planning and Development in the country where I learned a lot of the, the struggles that developing countries face with regards to developing policies and with access to data. Then after I worked as a flow miner as a data scientist, I, I learned a lot about programming and that inspired me to, to apply to the PhD program uh, in Singapore. And and they developed a lot of toolkits that used uh, mobile phone data to, to perform population mapping, to perform uh, uh, mobility analysis about uh, in countries that didn't have that kind of survey on ground. So we are trying to leverage new data to do that. And my interest was to, to pursue a PhD that, uh, uh, that, that researches this type of data in order to develop an understanding of society uh, and then to propose uh, policies based on that understanding. So uh, a little bit about what I, how I see the, the, the applications of data science to, to this field, it, it goes like this. So, so in economics, you learn a lot about regression analysis and, and then you learn how, how to regress one variable and another such that you can learn about the relationship between these two variables in a very succinct way. The, the good thing is that this is a very easy way for us to understand how the world operates, but the world is usually a bit more complex and you'll find like different way and, of clustering data and all that. And, and you might end up with something like on the right, like a Swiss row a clustering type of analysis. The problem is that this type of, uh, this, this type of insights can be very difficult to put in action from a policy perspective. So, so once you know the two variables interact in a very non-dynamic way, how then you go about and change the world such that you get the, the desired behavior that you want. So in the present case, what I'm actually doing is trying to bring this uh, insights into an application. So I'm currently investigating as we are as we are in COVID times. I'm currently investigating the disease outbreak in the university campus. Fortunately, uh, NUS didn't have any outbreak of the disease, and Singapore has been very good in handling the disease. But in the hypothetical scenario that it happened, um, we would like to know what to do, and we would like to know what to do before it happens as well. So. So traditionally, we have models of uh, disease spread that uh, look at the macro level, how the disease go, uh, how the disease goes up, how does it subside after a certain number of people get infected and then they recover, 
and how it ends. So this macro model uh, tells us only about how if we don't do anything, the disease will evolve. It doesn't tell us where we have to act. It doesn't tell us like which options are available to us. And even if we think about options that are available to us and we try to fit into that model, we're only gonna uh, change the behavior of those curves, but we're not gonna really have good insights about what's happening. So, so with that in mind, uh, we look at the campus and, and we saw that it, it is a very big campus. People come and go at different times of the day. And the, the, the nice thing about working on a campus is that you get to interact with other people. So exchange idea, bounce, bounce new projects, uh, talk with your supervisor, talk with your colleagues. These are activities that uh, really help to, to increase the research outcome. On the other hand, uh, these are the, the same kind of activities that help to spread the virus. And social research has shown that spontaneous interactions with people, it's what really drives uh, imagination, creativity, all those factors that increase uh, research outcomes. Uh, Zoom meetings are very good, but sometimes it's not, they're not very spontaneous and all that. So now that you understand how the, the, how the disease would spread in the campus, we, we look at uh, data that show how people interact in the campus and then we leverage the Wi-Fi data that the university collects uh, in order to understand how a simple mode of disease transmission would uh, affect the, the university. And based on simulation results, we then try to develop new policies that would, uh, that would allow us to divide the university into different zones such that we can minimize any potential uh, disease outbreak while minimizing also the disruption to, to the free flow of ideas and interactions that happens in campus. And in order to do that, because they're very non-complex problems, we utilize um, machine learning and we, we try to utilize uh, reinforcement learning and other non-linear approaches. And we try and we try to do that and develop uh, policy actions that are more intuitive and they can be real and they're more relate relatable by a policymaker. Um, so this is uh, this is a little bit about what I'm doing and uh, I hope that uh, it gave you some insights about my experience at the university. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have about the practicalities of life here, uh, anything that you would like to, to understand a bit better about my research, about my about the application process, about the first year, uh, or anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. Um, so questions, please. I think this is a good time to ask your fellow uh, PhD students. Well, well, I think people are pondering. Let me ask uh, you a question. Oh, that's one question. <laughs> is, the, uh, yeah, is the stipend enough to handle the expenses? Uh, I, I would say I would say that the stipend is uh, quite generous, and you can definitely live a good life in Singapore with the stipend. Uh, especially now, uh, Singapore has a lot of attractions, and food-wise, uh, there's many options you can spend. Uh, yeah. Only rent might be a bit expensive, but it still fits within the stipend. Yeah. yeah. Another question: Can you elaborate more on the intuitive policy action that you mentioned? All right, so so we, so what I'm trying to to, elabor to elaborate is uh, to develop uh, zoning 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 policies in the university. So in order to to make a policy intuitive, we need to be able to communicate it to to the policymaker. Uh, if we, we if we just tell him that he has to do some sort of Swiss roll into the university, then it will be very difficult to implement it. There's a lot of practicality involved. So, so we set up some constraints in our optimization such that like it can, it, it can create policy that is at the same time simpler, but at the same time more efficient. So this is a little bit of the trade-offs that I try to develop when I'm doing my own research. Yeah. So actually maybe, maybe a little bit more background on this work. Um, so uh, you, I, as some of you may probably know today uh, in the news, uh, 
I think uh, there are some reaction by the students about uh, zoning by, by the university, creating a lot of uh, so-called uh, inconvenience. So, so in this work, uh, I think it's important to know what's happening on the ground. So we look at data that, we, that can inform us about the mobility of the people. So Guilherme just now mentioned uh, minimizing the disruption to, to, to the activities is also an important aspect. So, so to do this, we can leverage on data that we have, but then it becomes very complex and then we need to borrow uh, methods from uh, non-linear linear methods from uh, machine learning and computer science. So, so maybe that, that leads me to one, one question that I, I want to ask Guilherme is, how do you approach, because your background is from uh, economics, econometrics, and now you're using reinforcement learning and deep learning and computer science mm -hmm. techniques. So how do you approach interdisciplinary research without feeling deluged? Well, uh, usually like uh, the, my background in economics and statistics gave me a lot of the mathematical foundations that I need to have to understand uh, some of the papers in computer science and in machine learning. And, and then a lot of the coursework in the first year also prepares you to to understand and and uh, to understand and relate to the literature, uh, usually I, I usually like I try not to to go to on a first read of the literature. I try not to go very deep, just to get an understanding. And once I once I see the kind of problems that I want to tackle, then then I will go more deeply into particular methods that could be useful. Also, communication with your colleagues and talking with other people in the field who are much more knowledgeable than you are uh, really helpful because they can sometimes explain something that you don't understand in a very intuitive way. And uh, sometimes just going past like that uh, small hurdle will allow you to understand an aspect, a field of research that you are not yet grasping very well. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, so, yeah, so for those of you who have questions and maybe want to ask, me more privately, I know. Uh, uh, so uh, please, uh, I think you can email him, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or you can, yeah. um, that's the email, right? Uh, or you can, I, I guess you can visit the IDS booth, right? So, so if you want to ask questions about the stipend and all that sensitive questions, all right? Okay, thanks. so uh, thanks, Gurmi. All right.